Hi, Honors Britlet. I hope you had a happy Easter. Thanks for returning to the underground. We're about to embark on one of the most important novels ever written and one of my favorites, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Frankenstein is considered the first science fiction novel ever. People started creating adaptations of it in Mary Shelley's own lifetime, and to date, thousands of adaptations of the story have been made. I dare say that at least 90% of all science fiction draws something from Frankenstein. Frankenstein is a very romantic novel rooted in its own time period, but it grows in significance every year. It examines the tension between wisdom and intellect, between destructive passion and healing empathy, between our desire for progress and our self-destructive impulses. It has a teenager's passion and frustration for everything that she has ever experienced in her life, but a seamless and considered examination of human excesses. It speaks to the alienated and dispossessed, but aims toward cultural healing, a world of personal reflection and communal acceptance. It is rooted in radical politics and poetics, yet it holds as its highest good gentle domesticity, and as its greatest evil, our desire to play God. It anticipates Freud and McLuhan before they were even born by predicting the tendency of well-intended technological developments to create monstrous and destructive shadows born of our own conflicted natures. When I was 19, I was playing drums in bands, I was going to the movies, I was hanging out with friends, I was trying to keep my grades together, uh, but I can tell you what I wasn't doing was writing Frankenstein, and neither were any of my friends. So what was it that inspired Mary Shelley to write such an amazing book at such a young age? I want to use this video to explore Mary Shelley's life so that we can prepare some biographical criticism of the text. We're in luck because the story of the writing of Frankenstein is as exciting as the story of Frankenstein itself. Let's begin. I think the best way to get into the soap opera that is uh, Mary Shelley's life is to look at her family tree. And I've tried to make one here for you. Let's see what it looks like. In orange, I have um, everybody who is directly related to her by blood, um, except for her husband, um, who she had kids with, obviously. So he, he gets to be orange also. So let's start with her parents, William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. Both of these people were... Um, prolific writers, they were revolutionaries, and um, they were very, very much into trying to secure rights for people in England and Europe in general. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft is famous for writing A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, and um, this is considered one of the, the first feminist works before there's even really such a thing called feminism. Um, in it, she argues that um, women need to have uh, better education, that they need to be able to um, inherit and own property, that it shouldn't automatically be transferred to their husbands or their children. She argued that well-educated women will enrich family life where um, just being considered wives and um, mothers basically forces them um, to be mentally undeveloped and less useful to the common good. Um, and basically, she's arguing for um, the uh, promotion of women, and she's challenging um, all sorts of laws that discriminate against women and keep them dependent on um, the whims of men who frequently don't deserve the authority that they, that they have. And when uh, Mary Wollstonecraft was in France um, during the French Revolution, she had an affair with a man named Gilbert Imlay. And Gilbert Imlay was an American who was basically uh, taking advantage of the French Revolution by smuggling in goods from the U.S. and selling them at a time when um, it was very, very difficult to get commercial goods into France. So um, she, he was kind of an opportunist. I don't really understand why she liked him so much. He didn't really seem to have the high and heroic ideals that she had. Um, but she was very in love with him, and she had a child with him um, named Fanny Imlay. Okay, this is going to be important in a second. So Fanny Imlay um, basically was born and... Uh, 
Gilbert ditched out on them. Um, as soon as she was pregnant, he basically said, hey, I'm going back to London. Um, I've got some trade to do with America. I'll come back for you soon. And he didn't. And then um, she went back to London when she could. Um, the revolution was getting really hairy. She was having a hard time there. She got back to um, England, basically penniless, uh, trying to raise a child in the middle of this revolution. Um, in France, uh, gets back to England, finds herself friendless, has to pretend that she's been married to this guy, um, starts calling herself Mary Imlay. Um, but uh, he basically blew her off and she had to raise the child on her own and this made her incredibly depressed and at two different times, she tried to kill herself, which is very, very sad. Um, she had met William Godwin who was um, another uh, revolutionary, he wrote an inquiry concerning political justice. And an inquiry concerning political justice is basically this work of anarchist philosophy. Um, he argues that if we have a well-educated populace, we basically don't need um, government, which is supposed to basically protect us in our ignorance. But if we can become uh, highly thinking, cognitive people who make intelligent decisions. We can govern our own lives and we don't really need the government quite as much. One of the things he argues against is um, the state's right to marry people. He basically says that it's love that unites people together. It's not the state and it's not the church. So he actually advocated this philosophy of free love. He thought that marriage uh, was an unfair social constraint on people and that really it should be their affection for each other and devotion that draws people together, not um, a contract of the state that basically says uh, you now belong to this person. So um, when she first had met William Godwin, it was at a Thomas Paine lecture. Um, Thomas Paine, uh, you know, the great political philosopher. And um, she was not impressed with him, but they did strike up a little bit of a friendship. And years later, when she returned to England, uh, they ended up having an affair. And the product of that affair was Mary Godwin, who becomes Mary Shelley down the line. Okay, so the author of our book, Frankenstein, Mary Godwin, has for her parents two of England's great revolutionaries. How great? Um, William Godwin, um, had all of these followers, all of these disciples, um, everybody from uh, Coleridge, you guys just read him, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, to Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr uh, came out to England to go uh, study under William Godwin. So, uh, you know, when he wasn't busy shooting Hamilton, there it is. Okay, so anyways, uh, Mary Godwin is born. Um, now, this is funny because Mary Wollstonecraft had problems with marriage. She didn't really like the concept, even though she um, wanted to marry um, Inlay. And um, what she kind of understood from Fanny was that her child was not going to have any protection under the law because she wasn't married. Um, she wanted to protect this new child from scandal. So she said to William Godwin, who didn't believe in marriage, even though she didn't really believe in it that much or thought there were problems with it, she said, let's get married. And the two of them got married and they ended up living on the same street, um, like uh, a few houses down from each other. Um, and they would send letters to each other and stuff like that. It's a very strange arrangement. But they basically wanted to maintain their freedom and... Um, you know, uh, they didn't live in the same house. And I think we're gonna tie this to something significant in a little bit. So when Mary was born, um, her mother ended up getting uh, an infection from delivering her and a couple uh, days later died. Um, so Mary Godwin never got to know her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, but she was raised by this, uh, this great intellectual, who um, basically decided he would teach her by letting her use all the books in his uh, huge library and by taking her on educational field trips and all that kind of stuff. And um, so he, was, he ended up adopting Fanny Imlay. And then he decided he couldn't really raise these two young girls on his own very well. So he decided he needed to get married. 
So he ended up marrying a woman named Mary Jane Claremont. Mary Jane Claremont. And Mary Jane Claremont had a couple children um, from two different um, men that she had had affairs with. Um, and they're not really important. She ended up making up the last name Claremont. Claremont wasn't really her last name. She just wanted to pretend that her kids were legitimate. So um, her kid from one guy was Charles Claremont and her uh, daughter from another guy was Jane Claremont who ended up changing her name to Claire because she thought that sounded cooler. So Claire Claremont. So Mary ends up growing up in this family that is kind of a mixed bag, right? Um, she is not full sister to any of her siblings, right? Um, all of her siblings have different fathers and um, um, the, they, they end up, uh, she's raised by this woman who just isn't really uh, very favorable to her, doesn't like her very much. Um, Mary Jane Claremont Godwin um, ended up sending Claire to private school and Claire was taught French and ended up speaking four different languages and got this education that the other daughters didn't get. The other daughters kind of had whatever William stuck together. And basically tensions just kept on getting stronger and stronger between uh, Mary Jane Godwin and uh, Mary Godwin. And so um, they decided it might be best if they sent Mary off to a boarding school in Scotland. Uh, but the family was always broke. They never had any money. Um, they tried to have a little publishing business, but that lost money. Um, basically, William Godwin didn't know how to manage money well at all. Uh, neither did his wife. So um, pretty soon they just decided, well, let's, her, let's send her to these revolutionary friends that we have in Scotland and they can raise her. So um, at age 14 or so, Mary Godwin was being raised by uh, this Scottish family. Um, when she came back to visit, though, she found that her dad had a new student, a new disciple uh, named Percy Shelley. And Percy Shelley um, right here was... Um, a revolutionary poet. He wasn't super popular in his own age, but he was respected by other radicals and respected by other poets. He just wasn't widely purchased by the public. Um, he came from a family that had money. His father was a baronet, um, but he had, um, he had been kind of a controversial teenager. When he was in college, he published a treatise um, defending atheism and got expelled for that. And um, he was kind of a prankster. He liked doing things like um, uh, getting static electricity machines and charging the doorknob to his dorm so that when people touched it, uh, they would get these electrical shocks and things like that. Um, apparently he stole some gunpowder and blew up a tree uh, at his school. So, um, yeah, and also he wasn't popular. He didn't have any friends. No one really liked him, and there was a daily tradition of beating him up and ripping his clothes every day. Um, so he did not have a very fun time when he was in school. Um, but he loved William Godwin's philosophy. He uh, sent him a letter saying, I want to be your student. By the way, my dad is rich. William Godwin was like, oh, great. I can take on a student, and maybe this guy can pay some of my bills for me. So... He was hanging out at the house and Mary Shelley had been, um, her favorite things were reading and writing. And she read her mother, she got to know her mother by reading all of her mother's works and her father's biography of, of her mother. Um, she was into all kinds of literature and she was very passionate and intelligent and she hit it off with Percy right away and Claire kind of would arrange for the two of them to meet in private. Their favorite place to hang out was over at her mother's grave. Um, so they would go out to the, the, uh, the churchyard where her mother was buried and they'd have picnics there and they would talk philosophy. And apparently that's where they fell in love with each other at this grave. What's interesting is that in this churchyard, um, there had been a few problems where at night, 
um, people who needed money really badly would steal bodies from the graveyard and sell them to scientists who um, would do autopsies and things like that. So grave robbing was becoming a way that some people made a bunch of money. Charles Dickens talks about this. Um, so, uh, you know, a little bit of a hint toward Frankenstein right there. Um, also, Percy Shelley's interest in science and electricity. These are hints toward Frankenstein later on. Okay, so Percy Shelley, the thing about Percy Shelley is that he was already married. Dun, dun, dun. So Mary Shelley, age 15, um, is madly in love with him. She runs off with him at age 16, finds out that he is already married um, to this woman over here, Harriet Shelley, uh, formerly Harriet Westbrook. And uh, Percy Shelley already has a daughter named Ianthe Shelley with Harriet. Um, but Mary basically says, I'm in love with Percy, and it's love that draws two people together. It's not a contract made with the state or with the church. Where did she learn this from? William Godwin. And her sister Claire, half-sister Claire, basically says, hey, I want to run away with you guys too. I hate it here. And so they let her come along, and the three of them um, cross through France and see all the destruction that's left over from the French Revolution, and they make it out to the Rhine, and then they run out of money and come back, and they have to live in a bunch of uh, lousy apartments, and they're hoping that Percy Shelley can make things uh, work because he has a rich dad, but his dad basically disowned him as soon as he ran off with uh, Mary. Uh, you would think that William Godwin would say, hey, Mary, I approve of your actions. I'm all for free love. I'm all for this... Uh, bohemian lifestyle you're living, but no, he was more of a dad than he was a, uh, a radical in this regard and basically disowned his daughter also. He didn't speak to her for three years. So, fun time so far. Are you guys hanging in there? Great. So, Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley run off and they're living with uh, Claire. And Claire... Um, probably had a little bit of a relationship going with Percy Shelley. Um, critics are split on this one, but we know the three of them were living together. Um, and we know that there are periods in Mary Shelley's life where she's very, very frustrated with Percy. Now he gave her lots of reasons to be frustrating. Um, he was very self-absorbed. Um, she was pregnant several times uh, with, with his kids very quickly, like Mary Shelley was. Um, so, uh, she gave birth prematurely to a daughter named Clara, and, uh, and this is when she's 16 years old. Um, Clara was born two months prematurely, and she only lived about seven days, and Mary Shelley had this, um, uh, dream in which uh, she kept on seeing her daughter, realizing that she only appeared to be dead, and she would take her to the fire and rub her and warm her up, and she'd come back to life. And she was convinced that if she would have um, uh, gotten up in the middle of the night to take care of her child, that she wouldn't have died. Um, that's not really true. Her daughter was very weak and all of that kind of stuff. But um, Percy was not very responsive. He basically was like, let's move on. And he also started wondering after a couple weeks why she was being so cold and distant. Uh, he started hanging out with Claire a lot more. And so that frustrated Mary Shelley. And then he also suggested, um, why don't you start spending more time with my friend, um, uh, William Hogg? and uh, maybe we can have kind of an open relationship. And it turns out she became kind of a friend of Hogg's, but she didn't really like this idea of having an open marriage, even though she wasn't philosophically against it. She just uh, needed time to heal from all of this pain that she'd been through losing a child. Um, and she also didn't like uh, how Percy was married to somebody else, was hitting on her uh, half-sister, and was probably having other affairs as well. So uh, Claire ends up um, deciding she wants to chase down Lord Byron. And Lord Byron is the most notorious romantic poet ever. Uh, he's kind of the first star of the tabloids. The tabloids were a brand new thing in Regency England. 
he's famous for his poetry. He's famous because he's a lord, you know, um, giving a, a very rousing, radical speeches in parliament. He's famous because he has had all kinds of very lurid affairs. Um, the weirdest one is um, with his half-sister, um, but there are other disturbing ones that I'll just save for never. And then um, he, he's uh, a very famous poet for writing Child Harold's Pilgrimage at this time. Um, people are just uh, gaga over Child Her Harold's Pilgrimage, can't wait for another canto to come out. Um, so he's very, very famous. Oh, he was exceptionally good looking. He also, um, he was compensating all his life for the fact that he had a club foot. His right foot was born deformed. So he uh, worked really hard at being very athletic for being a great boxer and swimmer and marksman. Uh, Shelly was also into guns. That's something that they kind of bonded over later. But uh, she managed to uh, kind of throw herself at Byron and Byron was feeling sad because he was being scorned by the press. And um, he ended up uh, basically having a short affair with her and then dumped her. And by 1816, um, the Shelleys figured we need to get out of England. Um, you know, William was not talking to them. William Godwin was not talking to them. Um, Percy was in trouble with his parents. They had to escape creditors because they were just writing bad checks everywhere they went. So um, Claire said, hey, I know. Why don't I take you to Geneva and you can meet Lord Byron? And Lord Byron was hanging out there because of some of the scandals that he was involved in. So um, they got a little place next to the chateau that he was renting in Geneva. And um, they decided they were going to spend the summer there. Now, this was kind of a way for Claire Claremont to get to see Byron because he didn't want to have anything to do with her, but the Shelleys were pretty excited to meet him. And also, they brought um, their uh, child, William, with them. Now, Mary Shelley had already lost their first child, Clara. She had also had um, a miscarriage, and she was on her uh, third child at this point. William, who was a little baby, and she called him Will Mouse, which I think is a really cute little name, Will Mouse. So um, who else was there? Uh, Lord Byron had his personal physician um, named John Polidori with him. And um, John Polidori, I've read different things. Sometimes I read that he was like a very uh, swarthy, oily, um, overweight kind of guy. And I've also heard descriptions that he was a fairly good looking guy. Um, he was an aspiring writer, but he wasn't a great writer. Um, and mostly he kept Lord Byron supplied with um, pharmaceuticals. So they're all hanging out in Geneva. And the thing about Geneva this, this time of year is that there was this huge earthquake in Singapore in 1815. And this earthquake made it so that uh, Europe just had terrible, terrible, terrible weather. They called it the year without a summer. Um, it was uh, just gloomy all the time. They barely saw any sunlight. Um, the waves were too bad for them to go like out on their boats or anything like that. And so, and it was rainy all the time, which is gloomy and cold. So they had to stay inside all the time. So they, they hung out in the home that Byron was renting and, um, basically they, they read and talked a lot. Um, Claire wasn't so much into the reading and the talking as she was in trying to, um, patch up her relationship with Byron. And in the course of the uh, visit, she realized that their earlier affair had resulted in a pregnancy. So she was um, constantly uh, freaking out and despondent over how badly Byron was treating her. Uh, he ignored her, he was mean to her. She was very worried about herself and the future of her child uh, that, that was going to be born soon. Um, Byron and Shelley would have these super long talks all through the night and they drink tons of wine. 
And Mary Shelley says that she listened attentively every night, but um, she's, she said that she never really talked a whole lot, but she'd listen to these conversations. And all of them read and read and read. Um, Byron um, was reading Christabel by Coleridge one night to everybody, and Shelley freaked out, and everyone was all afraid. And they had been reading um, Phantasmagoriana, um, which was a collection of German monster stories that had been translated into French. And these stories had like things like people being buried alive and people like, you know, there was a woman who um, had a uh, skull for a head and, um, you know, like someone else had like this uh, animated talking head. And, uh, they're just weird stories. One of the big things they were reading um, were these stories of vampires. And at the time, vampire stories uh, were more like zombie stories. Vampires would haunt the people who um, they were related to. People had to wear black and things like that so they wouldn't be recognized. That would, that's one of the, uh, the ideas of why people wore black after uh, loved ones died. Um, back then, the idea with vampires was that they would just try to, they were kind of like zombies that just needed to drink blood to live. A lot of times they would kill cattle and stuff like that. And these stories were probably um, in Eastern Europe. They, they mostly originated from the idea that a lot of times when bodies are buried, um, as they're decomposing, they kind of sit straight up. And if you don't bo bury the body deeply enough, then apparently it can kind of like work its way out of the ground. A lot of times people would find all of these bones and like devoured um, parts of carcasses near graves and they would say, oh man, the, they came back from the dead and they've been eating people or they ate my cows or they ate my, you know, and like what was really happening was wolves were just digging up the bodies and eating them. Sorry, this is all very gross, but it's going to play a role in the story later. So, um, with all these ghost stories that they're reading about, um, Byron said, let's have a ghost story writing contest. And whoever gets to write, whoever writes the best one, um, you get bragging rights. So, everyone's set to work on trying to write these ghost stories. Byron uh, basically wrote this tiny little fragment that didn't amount to anything. Shelley didn't really write anything himself. Um, John Polidori ended up writing a story that called The Vampire that is very important, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But Mary Shelley um, starts the contest not knowing what to write, and what she comes up with is a story that basically pulls a lot of her experiences together, and as we read the book, we'll talk about a lot of these experiences more. But she... Um, she thinks about everything that she's been reading. Uh, she's been reading Plutarch's Lives, um, which is about the, um, um, these ancient Roman uh, rulers and how they govern society. Uh, she's reading Paradise Lost, which ends up being incredibly influential in, um, in Frankenstein. She's reading uh, Goethe, The Sorrows of Young Werther, about alienation and, you know, the pain of being in love. She's also reflecting a lot on um, Greek mythology, uh, the story of Prometheus, and we'll talk about that on another uh, video. Um, but um, Byron and Shelley are also talking a lot about this art of galvanism, this idea that electricity can be used to bring the dead back to life. Um, there had been several experiments where um, people, uh, uh, like, um, uh, who is it, Luigi Galvani, where we get the term galvanism, he hooked electrodes to a dead frog's leg and made it move around and stuff. So he had assumed that electricity was the key thing, uh, the, the key to life. His uh, nephew tried to reanimate um, a prisoner who had been hanged for killing his wife and child. And uh, when he hooked electricity up to this body's face, uh, you know, the guy, um, I guess, jerked a leg and one of his eyes went open. And people, even though like he didn't bring the guy back to life, people were kind of like, wow, there's something here to this galvanism. Um, Shelley himself had been obsessed with electricity. He was very into science um, all through his formative years. Um, 
So when some people look at Frankenstein, they kind of wonder, well, is this Shelley? You know, and we could talk about that a little bit more soon too. So, um, Mary Shelley's having a dream one night. She's thinking about like how her own birth um, is tied up in her mother's death, how these two things, birth and death, are so intrinsically tied to each other. And she has this vision of a scientist um, bringing this monstrous body to life. And it haunts her, it plagues her, and she starts working on a short story. And Percy says, no, no, make it a full-length novel. And she keeps on writing and writing. And obviously she wins the, the uh, competition. She, she writes Frankenstein. So, cool stuff. When we look at Frankenstein, one of the big things is the monster is um, constantly lost in a feeling of not having any family, being all alone in the world, having been created and abandoned. And if you think about this in terms of Mary Shelley's life, um, she's born, her mom dies. Uh, William Godwin, when Mary Shelley follows his philosophy about free love, abandons her, right? Basically does not talk to her anymore. Percy Shelley, who she runs off with, is married to another woman and is possibly having an affair with her half-sister and has a few other affairs. She has, uh, she has intense guilt about losing Clara. Um, she names her own son William as an, as an attempt to try to get back into her father's good graces, and that doesn't quite work, right? So there's nothing she can do to make her father love her again. Um, so this, these intense feelings of abandonment. She also feels this weird sense of, you know, of uh, constant betrayal because Claire doesn't seem to have any boundaries. And um, she's constantly looking at Lord Byron, treating her half-sister like garbage and abandoning her. So huge themes of abandonment. Also, if you look at the family that Mary Shelley's put together, it's, it's adopted, it's very cobbled together, right? Who is her family? Well, it's kind of Lord Byron, right? It's kind of Shelley. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, sorry, I pointed the wrong one. It, it's, it's very much Percy Shelley, but he's not that great a family member, right? Um, her sister Fanny um, also um, uh, you know is basically attracted to Byron attracted to Shelley and you know none of them are full brother sister in her family um, there's a lot of death family Fanny ends up killing herself um, and um, uh, let's see Harriet ends up killing herself. Um, so, uh, in actually three weeks after Harriet kills herself, Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley get married. Uh, Mary Shelley had been calling herself Mary Shelley for several years at this point. Basically, as soon as she fell in love, she started calling herself Mary Shelley. Um, but she, she makes it official so that they can try to get custody of his kids. Um, they can't do it. Um, basically, the courts say, "Well, you're an atheist. You're not. You're not a fit father." Um, but they're getting married. Ends up patching things up a little bit with Percy's dad, but still. So uh, Mary Shelley has these very tenuous relationships with other people. Um, there's a lot of desperation in her family, right? When people feel like they aren't loved back, they start uh, threatening suicide, or they actually do kill themselves. So she's very aware of how violent passions are. She's very aware of how much she has to negotiate personally to have um, people who should love her love her. Um, she's very aware of how much she needs to be respected and how much of a price she has to pay to be loved and respected. And um, her life isn't super happy. When a lot of people read Frankenstein, they start looking at the idea that the monster might be a reflection of, of Mary Shelley herself and that Frankenstein might be a reflection of Percy Shelley. Uh, Percy Shelley, when he began writing, actually used the pen name Victor, as in Victor Frankenstein. Um, like I said, he was obsessed with electricity, obsessed with science. He could very easily be a cold and, distance and distant and self-obsessed person. Um, after they finished up in Geneva, um, they ended up going out to Italy, and going out to Italy, um, 
resulted um, in both the death of uh, little William and then their, uh, their other daughter, Clara. They named their second daughter Clara Everina. Both of them ended up getting sick and dying uh, within a year uh, of each other um, when they moved to Italy. Um, Shelley seemed to just kind of uh, move on and not do a lot of mourning. There was also some hint that uh, when Claire uh, gave birth to Alba Byron, um, who Byron renamed Allegra Byron, um, that there's a possibility Allegra Byron was actually Shelley's child also. Uh, when you read Shelley's reflections on, um, on the children that were, they were all traveling with, uh, we know that Allegra lived with the Shelleys for a little while. Byron didn't want her raised by the Shelleys. He was like, uh, I want my daughter to be Catholic. I want her to be Italian. I don't want her to be, if she stays with the Shelleys, she's going to be an atheist and a vegetarian. So he was kind of against that idea. But um, yeah, there, there, some people speculate that Allegra might have actually been Percy's child and that, um, you know, it seemed like Percy really uh, had a lot of um, beautiful things to say about Allegra, almost as if she were his daughter. Of course, you know, um, she was sort of his niece and uh, she, he did raise her for a little while. So he had a connection. I, I don't know if we have to necessarily say like, we, we, we don't know. We, we really don't know if, if she's Byron's child or Shelley's child. Um, I threw in one other interesting little thing here. Uh, Byron married a woman named Annabella Milbank Byron. Uh, well, he married Annabella Milbank and turned her into a Byron. But um, uh, their child, uh, Augusta Byron, uh, basically... Um, Annabella just knew within a year that Byron was a horrible person to be married to and got a divorce and she didn't let Byron near the child very often. I think uh, he maybe uh, spent, like when after they were married and divorced, um, he probably saw her like twice before he died. But Byron, uh, Byron's daughter, Augusta, um, Annabella wanted to make her really respectable and thought that she was less likely to be insane like her dad if um, she studied math. So she was trained to study math. And um, when she married, she became um, a Lovelace and she went by the name Ada Lovelace and um, worked with Charles Babbage, who was an early designer of mathematical machinery. And um, Ada Lovelace is now considered the first computer programmer ever, the first writer of code ever because uh, the work that she did on Charles Babbage's machine. Um, she wrote the first code for this theoretical machine um, that, that was never completed in Babbage's lifetime. So that's pretty interesting. And Ada liked the idea that she was a Byron, but by the time Byron died, um, he uh, had kind of reclaimed his name a little bit, and there was maybe a little bit of prestige in being a Byron again, but fun stuff. Okay, so... Um, I didn't tell you about Polidori's story. Polidori um, creates this story about the, there, there's this guy who um, is kind of like um, obsessed with this nobleman who is a really dark figure. He's very good looking and very charming, but he goes around Europe to casinos and does things like, um, uh, lead good people to become bankrupt or he'll help bad people make lots of money in the casinos by cheating. He um, ruins the reputations of beautiful young women and takes delight in this. And so um, it's, it's a short story. It's called The Vampire. It's not that great of a vampire story. It's not that interesting, but it, it's, it's notable for two reasons. Number one, it's clearly about Byron, right? Um, Polidori is clearly the person in the story who's obsessed with the Count, and the Count is clearly Lord Byron. The other thing that's interesting is it's the first time that a, that a vampire um, is good-looking. It's the first time that a vampire is a nobleman. It's the first time that he's charming, right? Uh, normally, they were just dead bodies walking around trying to get some blood. Um, so, why is this significant? Well... Um, the, uh, 
the novelist Bram Stoker reads this story and he's like, I like this approach to vampires. I want to use this. So Bram Stoker kind of takes this legend of Vlad the Impaler, mixes it with this very sophisticated, elegant uh, vampire count and creates Dracula, right? So this book is the prototype for Dracula. And then what's crazy about that is Dracula becomes the, this idea of like the uh, noble, suave vampire um, becomes the, um, the archetype for almost every other kind of vampire all the way out to Twilight, right? So anytime we're thinking about the idea of a charming, good-looking vampire, we really think about Lord Byron. Lord Byron is the prototype for vampires. Dun, dun, dun. Crazy stuff, right? So an incredibly interesting summer out in Geneva. And what happened to all of these people? Well, Mary Shelley, um, with the help of Percy Shelley, finishes Frankenstein. It gets published anonymously. Everybody thinks that Shelley probably wrote it. Some people think Byron probably wrote it. No one really thinks a woman wrote it um, until it's second printing and then her name's on it and uh, she becomes really famous. And by, I think it was 1823, they're already doing stage adaptations uh, for it. She dedicated the book to her father. Some people think that Frankenstein might be modeled after William Godwin, who is obsessed with making the world a better place, yet is um, very distant and awkward and um, uh, unloving toward um, his own children at times, to his own family. Um, a lot of people think Byron might be uh, depicted in Frankenstein, this kind of uh, Byronic hero, the self-styled uh, genius. A Byronic hero is kind of also our prototype for rock stars. This idea that um, Lord Byron, when he wrote characters, he would frequently base the characters on himself and then he would inflate them into being things that were much larger than himself, right? So he would become like the world's greatest lover or he would become, you know, in Don Juan, or he'd become like a, uh, a sorcerer who hangs out in the glaciers and is almost all powerful, right? As in Manfred, his big thing was taking his own identity and amplifying it into something even greater. And that's what we see in all kinds of rock stars. David Bowie, we see that in Mick Jagger. Uh, we see that in uh, Little Richard, Jim Morrison, right? It, it's this very popular kind of thing. So, um, the Shelleys, they end up losing Clara, they end up losing William, uh, they end up losing Clara again, the second Clara. And um, by the time Mary is 21, she only has one child left, Percy Florence Shelley. Um, one day while Shelley is in Italy um, sailing with some friends of his, uh, his ship sinks and he ends up dying and um, they burn the remains out on the beach in Italy because of quarantine rules. Um, but a friend of theirs smuggles his heart and gets it to Mary Shelley and apparently she kept uh, this burned heart with her for the rest of her life. Um, she was um, offered marriage proposals many, many times throughout the rest of her life, including one from Washington Irving, um, who wrote The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, but she said, I want to die a Shelley, right? She was very loyal to Shelley, even if Shelley wasn't very loyal to her. Um, she worked very hard after Shelley's death trying to um, give her son a respectable name. It never quite worked. His son got to inherit the Shelley estate, but there wasn't much of it left. She lived in poverty and she basically did what she could to edit Shelley's poems. She wrote a few more novels, but they didn't sell as well as Frankenstein did. Um, and she died of a brain tumor in her 50s, uh, but that makes her the only one of her friends who actually lived uh, that long. Claire um, ended up working a variety of odd jobs. She lost a leg road to Lord Byron. He uh, had her uh, placed in an Italian convent to be raised, but she ended up dying uh, by the time she was five. So there's another child who's lost. And then um, they never got custody of Ianthe or Charles Shelley. And who else do we have here? Lord Byron. So it's down to... Um, 
Oh, oh, John Polidori. Um, he published The Vampire. It was published anonymously. Everybody assumed Byron wrote it. Polidori couldn't get anyone to believe that he wrote it. Um, by the time he finally got his name on it, he was so depressed and felt so rejected that he ended up uh, killing himself. So um, very sad story there. So Polidori's gone. Uh, Claire lived a fairly long time. Um, she had always been against the Catholic Church, but in the last uh, decade or so of her life, she converted to Catholicism um, and grew to love the Italian people and uh, kind of tried to redeem herself a little bit. And what else do we have here? By the way, why are all these people into Catholicism? It's very strange, right? Um, Byron himself, uh, like, uh, England was very oppressive toward Catholics, and the Romantics were very into trying to free the victims of repression, you know, of government oppression. Um, so because the Catholics were so oppressed, uh, even though Shelley was an atheist and Mary Shelley um, was probably more of like a deist, and Byron was just a crazy man, and Polidori, I don't know what he was, but um, they all had these sympathies for the Catholics. They also loved going to Italy, and Italy was Catholic. Um, Byron, said, Byron wanted his daughter to be raised Catholic because he thought out of all the religions, Catholicism was the best one. He also became obsessed with um, trying to help the Armenian people. He uh, studied with a bunch of Armenian monks when he was in Italy and learned to speak Armenian and became a great advocate of Armenian culture. And this is where he learned to really dislike um, the Turkish um, slaughter of the Armenians and to um, basically become um, an advocate for all people who are oppressed by the Turks. Um, so Byron, um, he, hits, he, he gets into his 30s. Um, he's tired of all the scandal that's following him, and he's tired of the idea that he hasn't really done anything meaningful with his life. And someone from Greece um, sends him a letter saying, we're trying to fight in this war of independence against the Greeks, and we need, I mean, against the Turks, and we need financial backing. We need someone who can help us um, put our army together and wage a campaign against the Turks so that we can defend ourselves. And Byron basically decides, this is how I'm going to redeem myself. He sells off his estate in London, uh, gets together 20,000 pounds altogether, which is um, basically uh, several million dollars in today's money. And he goes to Greece and he um, devotes his fortune to putting armies together. He, he basically tries to feed and outfit them. Uh, he tries to get them guns. Even though he doesn't really know much about the military himself, he reads a bunch of books and tries to uh, train people how to march and um, tries to set up invasions. Unfortunately, he gets very sick um, while he's in Greece and he passes away. Um, before he really gets to fight, but the money that he raised ends up helping uh, the Greeks a fair amount. What's even more is that his celebrity lent to the Greek people, um, gains a lot of other, like gains this national, this worldwide attention where people start gunning for the Greeks. They, they want to um, help the Greeks in their war of, of liberation. And to this day, Lord Byron is considered a hero to the Greek people. Um, you know, he kind of goes out in this blaze of glory by, by, fighting for, um, by fighting for the Greeks against the Turks. So, interesting stuff. What have I not covered? Well, so basically, why do we care so much about Frankenstein today? Um, think about any movie, think about um, any story that you've read where um, people haven't fully considered the implications of the technology that they create. Um, think about all of these movies where technological progress ends up, uh, instead of being a thing that's going to help the world, it becomes kind of the expression of the dark parts of a person's personality that that person has never really considered. Um, I think you guys can name about a thousand movies. I don't want to name too many, but you know, there's a big thing. If we look at rock and roll, all rock and roll ends up being rooted in this uh, story of the writing of Frankenstein and the writing of the vampire. Um, 
I shouldn't say all rock and roll, but these end up being two big influences. This idea of the self-made image, this idea of the outcast, these are all very romantic things. Um, I think one of the biggest things with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is that we haven't really learned from it. Um, as a culture, we always think that we're giving everything a fair and balanced go of it before we introduce new technology, and we almost never do. We focus on the good that we think will come from the new technology. We don't really think about the implications of what's going to go wrong. And Mary Shelley basically says, if we're not in touch with our emotions, if we're not looking at our motivations for why we do what we do, if we don't have enough self-knowledge and enough compassion in our thinking that basically any step toward progress is going to turn into this um, monstrous abomination. Uh, and uh, I, I personally think she's right. I, I think that very frequently our best intentions end up creating these very dark results um, when we're talking about technology. When we think about the idea of, for instance, social media drawing us all closer together, we don't think about how easily it turns us into factions. We don't think about as we're um, uh, communicating with friends we haven't talked to for years that we're alone in a basement somewhere uh, not socializing with people, right? Um, we think about using the nuclear bomb to win World War II, but we don't think about the implications of the Cold War that, that results as a re afterwards, right? So very frequently we're not aware of what it is that we are creating as we create it. So that's my video. I know this has been a very long one. I hope you found the story interesting. For tonight, what I'd like you to do is read the letters section of Frankenstein. These would be the letters that Robert Walton creates. Uh, don't start with chapter one, start with the letters. Also, don't start with the prologue or the intro. You don't need to read whatever editors have written or what Mary Shelley wrote like you know, in her notes. You just need to start with Robert Walton's letters to his sister. Cool, thank you so much, and I'm glad you came to join me on the underground. Mm -hmm.